This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. We're live. I'm here in the Think Tech studios, um, and we're calling this Life in the Law. It's a very important law discussion. And I'm with Sandra Schwartz, who is an associate professor at UH Manoa That's Teaching right. History. I get that yeah, right so far? Absolutely. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's going to be great because you just published a book. Here's the book yeah. I want to show everybody the book. <laughs> this is the book, okay? And uh, in fact, we have a slide of this book. We show, okay, from bedroom to court, very provocative, and then you read yeah. a small type that says law and justice in the Greek Greek novel, yeah. bedroom to courtroom in the Greek novel. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew, right? Yeah. So this is about marriage, about sex, about trials and tribulations and Perry Mason kind of oratory and all that, and wow. This Travels is, around the world, dangers <laughs> at sea, uh, pirates. Um, <laughs> Evil, Those are exciting times. Lascivious satraps. <laughs> wow, exciting times. Yeah. Well, they were exciting in the minds of the authors who wrote them for their audiences. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, put it in a, a historical continu continuum for me. Where, when did these uh, novels and uh, scenarios happen? Um, where, where, where was it in the, the uh, Greek and Roman period? So, um, when you take world history, you kind of go through the march of civilization and you get Greece and then you get Rome. Um, I study uh, the Greek world under the Roman Empire. In fact, most of the Greek literature that survives, or uh, Greek texts in general that survive uh, to, for, up until now, are mostly from the period when the Romans dominated the Greek-speaking world. Oh, the interesting. Is there a reason for that? Uh, well, uh, the period of the Roman Empire was uh, one of the high points of civilization uh, in terms of the engineering and the you know um, uh, urban development and the growth of schools and literacy. Uh, and this was a high point um, that wasn't matched in European history until the 18th century or 19th century even. So um, when, when archaeologists and scholars of the ancient world go and look at um, the material remains and the texts, we have like a huge a pile of, of material to get through till we get down to the earlier levels yeah. of, uh, of, the, um, of the culture. So um, it, the Roman Empire was a thriving, productive time, and so we have a lot of evidence from that period, which makes it very you know, interesting. <clears throat> That's I, I mean I, I studied history much later. My my, my minor in history yeah. at at, uh, at college was about the uh, 19th century and all that, <laughs> um, and I didn't spend a lot of time on the classics. I have to say, but I do remember that it went from, you know, the the days of Greek glory to the days of greater Roman glory. Yeah. But I we forget that the Greeks had a fair amount of glory going on themselves. Yeah, and the interesting thing about the authors who have studied um, in in this book that I wrote is that they themselves were looking back at the past glory days of ancient Greece. Uh, so many of the novels are set in a period that was um, four or five hundred years prior to what yeah, their, uh, the actual um, audiences were reading. Yeah. And so they, they did have this um, memory of a glorious past um, that they tried to market to the Roman emperors. Because this was the way that the Greeks could claim for themselves a seat at the table of power. Ah. And eventually, the Greeks became, uh, came to have very important positions in the administration of the different Roman emperors. And so 
um, and, and the Greeks were very clear about um, reminding the Romans that the Greeks, the glories of ancient Athens, really preceded you know the glories that the Romans collected. Yeah, yeah. Good so, for them, um, you know. Yeah. This reminds me of a point that's been a thread this week, and that is, uh, you know, Hawaii's great contribution and potentially its greater contribution going forward is its art, its culture, its its, its indigenous and local uh, intellectual property. Right. Uh, and it sounds to me like what the Greeks were selling to the Romans in order to get that leverage was we have a great artistic literary tradition. Right. So listen to us. We have a certain amount of wisdom Absolutely. to offer you. Absolutely. <laughs> and if you go, you know, look at in the famous archaeological sites from um, uh, Greece and Rome, you see that the emperors were willing to throw tons and tons of resources to these Greek cities in the eastern Mediterranean to rebuild temples and theaters and um, arenas for um, athletic competitions. And so it was, it was considered a, um, a status symbol for Roman emperors emperors to become benefactors of Greek cities. And the <laughs> Greeks who lived in those cities uh, were very careful to, you know, to, um, to cultivate those relations with, with the Roman emperors. So it's really during um, this period of time from about like the second to the fourth centuries CE um, that we can really speak of a true Greco-Roman culture. Yeah, a Greco-Roman is almost like a partnership. It's almost right. like you know we, we collaborate rather than we, we take dominion over you and, and uh, we, we put you in chains. Right. Uh, it's like benign uh, imperialism in its own way. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, you yeah, could say yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in this context mm -hmm. now, somebody was writing novels. A number of people were writing novels. So, you know, in, in the early part of that millennia, mm -hmm. uh, what was a novel, actually? And could you buy it on Amazon? No. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon, well, the Amazons were in Scythia, so I don't think you could buy it from Okay. There. Well, the interesting thing about um, these novels was that they were written in prose. Now, we take it for granted today that um, novels are prose fiction. Uh, but in the ancient world, prose was the medium of things such as uh, philosophy, history, medical texts, um, important truth-bearing uh, works. Um, so at some point in time, we don't know exactly who started it. Um, one scholar of the ancient novel said that you know the novel, the ancient novel was invented on a Tuesday in July. <laughs> at, at, at three o'clock. <laughs> yeah, three o'clock. Yeah, you know, in the hot afternoon sun. You know, you kind of, your mind wanders. Uh, so, um, so uh, Greek novels were um, they they were. Uh, I should say classic and classical scholars were aware that there were these Greek novels floating around, uh, but most classicists kind of pushed them aside as not very serious literature. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until about the 1980s or 90s, around the time when I was in graduate school. Fair enough, school, yeah. Uh, that and that would have been in Columbia right, University, in Columbia okay, University. where you spent plenty of time. Right, right? plenty of time, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so many uh, classicists just ignored these Greek novels uh, because, frankly, um, the plots of the novels are very corny. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this young, a uh, young boy and a young girl meet each other in one of these cities. They're both aristocratic. They fall in love. You know, sometimes there, are, there are descriptions of lovesickness and, you know, rivals for the hand in marriage of another. And it's really corny. And usually they end up, you know, going on a honeymoon where they sail off and they're captured by pirates and they end up on a seashore. I'm just kind of <laughs> I'm giving it an like, overview. Um, it sounds like daytime TV. It is. <laughs> Soap opera. Tonight. It is. It is. And so you can, so when I first encountered these novels, I thought, what, what have I gotten myself into? I really wanted to study Sophocles and East the great cities. thinkers. Yeah, the great yeah. thinkers. But instead, you know, I, I, I developed an affection for these novels. Uh, because they were so strange and 
you know, um, hackneyed in a way. <laughs> I thought there there must be something here. Uh, so because they're written in prose, uh, ancient audiences received them as being somehow real stories. So I, I was isn't, interested. Isn't that what happens today too? <laughs> you know, it's it's art imitating life, imitating art, right, and all that, right. and people get a little confused about which is the real one. They, and <laughs> and uh, and some people were quite quite threatened uh, by this new genre of writing fiction in the form of prose. Now, of course, in Greek literature, there were stories that were fictional, um, and, but those were mostly in uh, they were written in in. Uh, poetry. So if you think about the epics of Homer, sure, the sure. Iliad and the Odyssey, that, that's the root for all of Greek literature, especially yeah. the Odyssey, which is also an adventure story. And this came love. later, though. This was, this was yeah, a, this a product that was developed after the, those, those classical poems. Right, right. You know, it was inspired by those poems, but someone said, hey, what if we made a fictional version, or I'm sorry, a prose version of the Odyssey? Uh -huh. You know, what would that look like? Uh -huh. So, um, what strikes me about this yeah. is that, you know, who knew from a novel? Who knew? I mean, in the year, of, say, 5000 BC, that was not even, un, you know, not even yeah. imagined. All of a sudden, these guys were writing, call it a novel, and they were talking about uh, love stories and all this. It sounds like it was like first impression. It was they, they sort of invented something you know, under the under the uh, the reign of the Romans somehow. Right, right. They kind of invented something, and audiences had a taste for exotic stories yeah. um, with the you know extension of the empire you know the, the people in the Roman Empire were kind of coming uh, in contact with different cultures and different stories and um, you know a lot of these stories were orally you know um, handed down um, there were stories of, for example, Alexander the Great that became um, not history, but became like these fantastic, mythic stories. And those circulated, and those were very popular in the Roman Empire. Uh -huh. Well, isn't, the, uh, isn't one of the elements of all of this is that between the Greeks uh, and Alexander and the Romans, they were, they were doing very unusual things, developing these huge empires that had never been seen before mm -hmm. and hadn't, weren't seen afterward for a thousand years. And so you know, what's, what strikes me about it is that there had to be this kind of, this kind of pollinate, pollinization going mm -hmm. on that, that, um, that yeah. stimulated yeah. people to yeah. write these novels and have these stories. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it, and in the stories themselves, um, the basic plot is that the, um, the couple uh, usually start from a Greek city and end up, you know, uh, in the far-flung regions of the civilized world, even beyond the civilized world. The Persian Empire comes That's into play. Um, Egypt, um, uh, Meroe, which was uh, the famous capital of Ethiopia. Uh, in the ancient world, and, <laughs> and so all of these, you know, stories about you know going and traveling and meeting strange, exotic people who don't speak your language. Well, sometimes in the stories, you know, magically the king of Meroe speaks perfect Greek because <laughs> you know that's the language of culture. So what king wouldn't you know be cultured? Kind of a cultural travelogue we have here. Part of the assimilation yeah, process. Yeah, oh. yeah, but it's not real. That's yeah, the yeah. thing. Okay. It's, it's completely um, made up, yeah. and um, these novels were were very much created um, to reinforce Greco-Roman culture and ideas. Ah, uh, so there was a, a, a method about the madness. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how methodical it was, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we, we, there are three uh, stories, uh, three novels that you wrote about in this book, and you have been studying them for a long time, to try to analyze them and and draw, you know, the, 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 the what we can learn from them. And uh, after 
this break, Sandra, okay. I would like to get into all three okay. and see uh, what the common denominators are Sounds and good. what kind of analysis you could make and what we can learn from them today okay. from what you wrote. Sandra okay. Schwartz, Assist Associate okay. Professor at UH Manoa, teaching history and writing this book. This book which just came out, I mean just just came out, see yeah. that book? <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about that book. Yeah. I'll, read it. I'll read the title, From Bedroom to Courtroom, it's a, it's a sex thing, Law and <laughs> Justice in the Greek Novel. Yeah. We'll be right back. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Life in the law, and Sandra Schwartz is kind of a lawyer. I mean, she's a, a legal a observer, a wannabe <laughs> lawyer, but not the law of today necessarily. The law of maybe 300 A.D. <laughs> something like that. Something like that. So um, yeah. So uh, you said the book was inspired. Your book was inspired by uh, Sally Engels, was it? Sally Engel Meyer. Meyer. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Sally Engel Mary. Mary. Okay. So what was the what was the inspiration? Well. Um, as I was going through these hackneyed novels, I thought, what can I get out of them? You know, and um, I had moved to Hawaii in 1995, and um, and I'd moved from New York. Uh, and when I moved here, I, it dawned on me that this was what um, colonization looks like. Because um, you don't necessarily have that in New York. The colonies <laughs> no. are buried long, long yeah, uh, deep. Yeah. And so I found this book by Sally Engel Mary called Colonizing Hawaii. And I read it with great interest because she talked about how the um, uh, indigenous Hawaiian legal systems uh, interacted with the col colonizing power. And once I read that, it just clicked in my mind that um, Greece was a colonized power by Rome. Yeah. And so you have a system where um, there are overla overlapping jurisdictions. Yeah. And with that, there's a lot of potential for, um, for uh, conflict. And, and change. And change, yeah. right, and uh, uh, acculturation as yeah. well. So, um, so that that book paradoxically um, made me rethink the way I was looking at these trial scenes in these novels. So, each of the novels that exist in their relative totality has at least one trial scene. Uh, ancient audiences had a hunger for these trial scenes. It was probably it was definitely part of the culture of living in a city in the Roman Empire. Uh, there were trials that were being put on every day. Trials were typically um, typically occurred in you know porticos or public spaces. These were public trials. Oh yeah, yeah. They were yeah. public trials, and they would attract large audiences. We have you know evidence of you know people milling around um, the courts just to kind of see what the gossip was or what was new <laughs> or what the scandals were, and sometimes you know the crowds would get rowdy and. And so it was kind of a, an, a, an aspect of urban life in the ancient 
ancient yeah, world. Yeah, and they were finding their way to a, a law system, a system of laws where they could, you know, uh, take problematic issues and discuss them in public and have oratory about it. It was like the beginning of what we have now, almost like. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, and the interesting thing uh, with these novels is because they're romance novels, they're, there's a lot of um, episodes of, you know, rape or, you know, adultery or all these lurid, sensational crimes. And I mean, this is part of, of the, you know, of what ancient audiences expected to see. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing was that in, um, in ancient Greece, in like the fifth century, the Greece of Pericles, uh, women were relatively secluded. That is, they, they didn't really go out and mill around in public that much if they were respectable women. This uh, is the 5th century BC or BC, AD? BC. BC. Okay. And um, the, Roman Empire, the uh, Roman culture had a different attitude towards women's participation in public. Um, in, in ancient Roman families, uh, first of all, uh, there was a value placed on, on daughters because daughters could be married off to allies. You can make marriage alliances. And so um, Roman women had a little bit more authority and control over the family and the households and sometimes got involved with, in politics in Rome. Uh, so. Um, it's part of that same acculturation. It's, 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 that, it's positing two cultures, right. seeing what comes out of it, and then writing about it so people could under, and they could see into the into the, the arena, so to speak, right. of a trial. Right. And I can see why you get very interested in this yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, really. it's kind of it's a weird. And thing. then these and these novels have pretty sexy uh, and personal kinds of stories. And uh, the, the, do the novels announce the result? Do they tell you how it came out? Uh, well, yes, sometimes. I mean, these aren't real trials, mind you. Of course. You. Um, so the the trials have to the trials are trial scenes are wonderful mechanisms for tying up loose ends at the end of a story. And in our culture, you know, you don't have to look very far to go to the movies and see trial scenes all over the place. We still have that hunger. Sure, we do. For you know, competing stories yes. with a victor and a loser. Yeah, sure, end. like a gladiatorial contest. No? Yeah, yeah, there's a actually, similarity there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> some disputes could be settled with a gladiation. That's for sure. Um, so. Um, Roman culture, Roman law um, had developed um, in a much more rational and organized fashion than Greek law ever was. And so that enabled the, the Roman Empire to extend its reach throughout the empire because they had a systematic, codified, more or less, not perfectly codified, yeah. uh, a system of laws and a culture of, of legalism. Yeah, the benefits of having an empire because you your, your jurisdiction was greater, yeah. and you had a need to make it uniform, right. and all that. And, and there was Augustus. You spoke of Augustus. Right. He criminalized certain things that were not criminal before around right. sex and marriage. Right, and that's kind of a really odd moment in world history. Uh, prior to that time, you know, if 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 you were married, and you know, if your wife had an affair with someone. You know, that would be settled behind closed doors. Uh, but or, or maybe by some sort of dastardly act. <laughs> dastardly, yeah, a lot of, you know, honor killing and yeah, things yeah, like yeah. that. But Augustus, um, who came, came out of a very bloody civil war um, in which much of the senator, senatorial elite was slaughtered, Augustus decided it was time to bring back family values. To use a modern term. <laughs> and his family values were that if, if a husband knew his wife was having an affair, any man could prosecute that husband <laughs> and bring him to trial in a public court oh to be embarrassed, you know, in front of the whole community. And punished. And, and eventually punished. He could mm -hmm. be disgraced. His uh, status, his social status would be degraded. Um, he, his wife would be degraded to the status of a prostitute. Um, he, and, uh, a husband who kind of, um, you know, turned a blind eye to his wife's lovers could be uh, degraded to the status of a pimp. 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, you know, in an honor society such as Rome was, it was um, really devastating for a man to have his status degraded like that. Yeah. So Augustus uh, initiated a law. Um, actually, there were a series of laws. Um, after he became emperor of Rome, the first emperor of Rome. And he, um, he, he tried to regulate family life. Was there a political reason for that? Was, I mean, aside yeah. from the, the morality of it, was there a reason in terms of governing that he needed to advance? Yeah, well, it was always a good idea to have a threat to hold over a the threat. elites. It wasn't act. actually for social stability as much as having control. Huh? No, you know, I mean, pro, uh, le, uh, laws like that, you know, that govern family values and morality, cut both ways. And, um, and Augustus tried to um, rein in the, the aristocracy, the senatorial elite, um, by uh, threatening them. Uh, it was a control thing. It was a control a thing, thing, right. Uh, he, and they were probably doing plenty of this within the senatorial elite. Right, yeah. right. One of the interesting things was that Augustus allowed women who had given birth to three children um, their legal independence. So women traditionally in Rome had to have a guardian, a male guardian, to transact their business. But a woman who had three children um, could transact her own business. In Emancipation. Her own yeah, she was emancipated. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, I mean, there, there are questions about whether that actually was very effective. Some people think Augustus was concerned about the depopulation of Rome, but that may have been a myth. Well, you know, this all, this all suggests to me that not only, you know, did we see, we, we have to look at this, I'm sure you do, uh, through the lens of history. We have to see it where it existed, what the factors were, what the sea changes and the evolutions were, you know, socially, historically, militarily, mm -hmm. um, and, and especially with regard to the empires that were that were emerging and, or, or, or declining at the time. Uh, really interesting history lesson. So you can learn history through a novel. You can certainly learn it when people People are making making advocacy in their orations in the, in the trial right. parts. So you analyzed all three, and at the end of the day, I mean, I think it's useful. Uh, it may be very <laughs> classical, if you will, but <laughs> yeah. it's very useful. Yeah. So we have a, we have a, we have the book mm -hmm. that came out, and I wonder if you could read a piece just to, so we can sort of taste your prose. May okay. I use that term? Sure, <laughs> I'd love to. Okay, so this is just for my introduction. Okay, in ancient Greek and Roman culture. Marriage was traditionally an institution for the propagation of patrilineal bloodlines, particularly when property was at stake. This was true at least among the elites whose perspectives are so disproportionately represented in the surviving literature from antiquity. At some point, however, there arose the concept that mutual love and fidelity ought to be the foundation of marriage. This ideal is espoused in a genre known as the Greek ideal romance or novel. The five extant novels that have survived in full present a model of normative sexuality. They typically begin when a boy and girl fall in love, undergo a series of adventures that test their love for each other, and end with their blissful union or reunion in marriage. <laughs> but le let me just go on. I have okay. Please. This study, however, is not about love. In, it instead focuses on the dark side of their romantic ideal, adultery, the inversion of the emblematic value of conjugality. Really? It sounds like, may I say, a Greek tragedy. May I say that? <laughs> okay, so are you teaching this also in your, in your teaching at UH? Uh, can I take a course and, and, and discuss this with sure. you in greater detail? Absolutely. Yeah, you I have can a, go on for hours. I, well, I would like to hear it. So uh, the kids come around, the students come around. Uh, is this popular? Oh, yeah. Well, I teach both um, Greek and Roman history. And, you know, the student, uh, students of our era are familiar with the fantasies of yeah, the ancient yeah. Greek and Roman world, and I try to disabuse them. What they <laughs> learned from the, you know, the 300, you know, the, and, um, 
So yeah, I, I do get students. Um, it's, it's actually nice to find that the classics are alive and well yeah, at UH Manoa, yeah. and that there are students who who want to study it. And I think it is definitely relevant. If you you examine the human condition, the and the fundamental points of humanity are still the same. Still the same. And we can learn from what they did. In fact, it, you know, it has it has uh, cast a shadow over or all of European history and maybe mm -hmm. global history. Uh, to to live there, I mean, to live in your mind at that time mm -hmm. and to feel, you know, the processes that were going it must be really fabulous. Peter. So, what's your next book? Uh, well, I think I'm going to work, work on more trial scenes. Um, this time in Plutarch, who was a, a polymath who lived in in Boeotia, a uh, like a backwater area of Greece under the Roman Empire, but he was trying to sort of assimilate Greek and Roman culture. So um, he wrote a series of parallel lives, which were very influential to the founding fathers. They were steeped in this uh, in this literature, yeah. and so they had they could draw upon models of heroism and um, and. Uh, anti-heroism and depravity all the whole gamut is out there yeah, you know you can uh, you can learn a lot about the book by just going on the web because it, it was recently published and there's a there's a lot of hits on it and um, by the way have you been to Greece actually yes. Sandra? yes so when you go to Greece you can see all these Greek words and places that 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 play out yeah. the fantasy no? yeah well I, I think that I can speak modern Greek but when the words come out of my mouth the modern Greek think I'm crazy. It's as if you know, I were speaking, you know, Chaucerian, really Chaucerian really. English. Really. Yeah. And it's on Amazon, this book. Uh, the title is uh, From Bedroom to Courtroom, a tremendous overlay there, Law and Justice in the Greek Novel, learning about, yeah. uh, you know, the, the sort of the, uh, the, the fertile the, crescent of all these and here things. here are the spectators, the jurors, Right. Oh, yeah. Hearing at the woman on trial who yeah. isn't shown in this passing country. judgment. Yeah. <laughs> passing judgment. And you can go on Amazon and you can buy it, and it's not it's not cheap. Not cheap. But I say it's worth it. Unfortunately, they're out of stock right now. You must be either very popular or about yeah. about to have a deluge of books onto Amazon. Yeah. Well. If only. <laughs> <laughs> so, what would you say to people as to why this book is relevant in our time? Uh, because we are still um, bringing people to trial, um, judging them for things that really are private, individual issues. Ah, uh, I see. Mm -hmm. Had it not been for what was going on in Greece under the Roman Empire, maybe we would have had a completely different view of that today. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Sandra Schwartz, Associate you very Professor much. UH Manoa History. <laughs> yes. You know where I am. <laughs>